Hi, I'm Dr. Tim McLaren, and I'm going to take you through what I would do if I were trying to hack my way to a rare disease diagnosis today. So I'm going to use the scientific method here, roughly speaking, and the first step is observation. For each sign or symptom that I'm experiencing, I would uh, start to observe these things about it. It's the OPQRST framework that physicians use. So um, onset, provocation, palliation, quality, quantity, radiation, severity, timing, and associated symptoms. And I would keep note of my observations using that framework each time uh, one of the symptoms occurs. Over time, you'll begin to develop um, a very good base of observations um, that you can then start to match to diseases. The next thing I would do is cross-check with my family and find out if any of them are experiencing the same things. Um, a lot of diseases can be genetic, um, and also a lot of diseases can involve behavioral uh, behaviors that are also passed down in the family. I would, after spending some time observing my, dis my disease process um, and taking these careful notes, I would try to summarize my findings, look at the bigger trends um, for each of those signs or symptoms that I experience. Next, I would find the medical terms which are associated with each sign and symptom. These terms uh, are what, how th the diseases are described in the literature. And so if you wanted to try to match to a specific disease, it'll really help to use the right words here. You can do this by going to Google and typing in the search bar, medical term for whatever, whatever your problem is, medical term for peeing blood or you know whatever it may be. It's also important to see if there are other medical terms that maybe are better descriptions than the ones you've chosen. So you might say, you know, if I said medical term for peeing blood and it shows me hematuria, then I might type into my Google search bar hematuria versus, and then just see what the autocomplete uh, shows me at that point. Um, because there may be other closely related terms that could also describe what I'm uh, experiencing. So it's really important to get the, those words right. If you get them wrong, sometimes that can lead you down the wrong path diagnostically. Um, and it's, medical professionals can be helpful here too. So if you describe what you're experiencing in very simple terms, plain terms to your physician, um, they may be able to help you know what is the medical word for that thing. Um, and you can ask them for their notes as well. That's another good source of, uh, to see how they're describing your, your signs and symptoms. So we've, we've started building up our observations and now we're going to move to hypothesis generation. I would start with your own doctor. Start with medical professionals. Um, get their take on what this might be. Take note of it. Um, and the tool that you can use to keep track of the hypotheses, the diagnostic hypotheses that are presented to you um, is a very simple table. In the first column, I would put the, the diagnosis that's been suggested. In the next column, I would put evidence for that diagnosis. And then in the next column, I would put evidence against that diagnosis. So each time you hear a medical professional tell you a diagnosis they think you might have, ask them, what's the evidence for that? And what's the evidence against that? The next source you could go to uh, would be digital tools. So there are tools out there where you can put in your signs and symptoms, and they'll give you a list of potential diseases. So we'll start with the, um, with the case from CrowdMed. So this is where people can post their, their case and try to get the crowd to help them solve it. And I'm going to just copy the, the whole case and we'll try ChatGPT first. So we'll ask ChatGPT, please provide a differential diagnosis for the following case and paste the case in and it's given us a primary diagnosis that it thinks it is as well as um, other diagnoses that could be considered and it's talking about some evidence for and uh, against some of these and it also gives you some information about them so pretty useful 
One huge caveat with ChatGPT is that you have to fact check everything that it tells you because it can literally make this stuff up and it will sound real. It's just part of how it works. Let's go to the next one. Um, this is Enola. So one of the key findings in our case is this severe muscle uh, weakness and atrophy in the hands and in the feet. So we're going to call that uh, let's say distal muscle atrophy. Um, and you'll notice there's an autocomplete happening here. And this guides you towards terms that are in the database. So you have to use the terms that are in the database in this one. You can't just type in anything you want. Um, and each of these terms is associated with disease. Um, and there's a frequency of association there. So that helps sort of determine how probable each disease is. Um, you can also look and see what other uh, clinical findings go, go along with this disease. And does the, does the patient have this or not have this? You can say, no, they don't have Pes cavus, um, et cetera. And the list will resort as you go. Um, it also gives you a description of the disease. It gives you a, a description of the clinical findings. Um, and you can see how frequently the disease occurs in the population, which can help you decide um, how to use it. The final one I'll go through is find zebra. Um, so I can search for the same terms. Um, here I can search anything I want. And um, it does kind of a more simple word matching um, algorithm. Uh, but again, you're, you're getting a list of potential matches. You just have to kind of look and see, is this really a match to what I was searching for. Fine Zebra and Enola are focused specifically on rare diseases. The strength of one of the strengths of ChatGPT is that it also includes um, knowledge of common diseases. Another um, tool that you can use is the wisdom of the crowd. So there are sort of ways of crowdsourcing your diagnosis. The first one I'll introduce you to is CrowdMed. And this is a site where people can post their medical case, and then other people can come on and try to help solve the case. So we'll take a look at some cases here. We'll go to solve medical cases. And um, let's filter on um, high quality cases for the sake of this demonstration. Um, let's say extreme dizziness and vertigo. Let's see what this person has. So you can see the person can put their name, the location, age, can disclose as much as they want to disclose, basically. Um, you can put in symptoms, your medications. This is like kind of the full medical history that uh, a doctor would take if you were coming in to, for a visit. You can see that there are eight medical detectives who have contributed to this case, which could be um, suggesting a diagnosis or making some discussion about the diagnosis. Um, they try to gamify it. So there are points allocated um, that you can win if you help make the diagnosis. Um, and there are even cash rewards um, that can come from helping to make a diagnosis. So this is a great site. And I think they do a good job of sort of trying to focus the conversation towards getting a diagnosis. Um, and they do also a good job of helping to organize the information for, for people. Um, these are, I didn't have to sign in to see these cases. So if you put a case on CrowdMed, people will see it. Um, it's visible on the web. This site is interesting to me because um, there is, you, you do have to sign in um, before you can see any of these sort of conversations that are happening. Um, there are communities and there are conversations here. Um, and so, yes, this may be a way to help you get to a diagnosis, but there could also be a lot more sort of support for you along the way as well. Um, so one way I might use this, if I were seeking a diagnosis, I might come in here and see, okay, are there any communities that are discussing some of the things that are really bothering me? Like maybe I have arthritis, maybe I'm 20 years old and I have arthritis already. Um, or perhaps, um, I have you know, a, uh, maybe I have celiac disease. And um, you might want to know, is this part of a larger 
problem. So get into the conversation with the community and see, yeah, ask your questions of the community and, and you can also be there to help support other people. So um, this is not just hacking to a diagnosis. This is a little bit bigger picture thing. Something to try. I haven't tried it myself yet um, because you actually have to have, you know, one of these conditions to sort of be in the community. Um, and I, I wanted to respect that sort of uh, barrier that of, of privacy that people have. I would probably stay away from putting your medical information on mainstream social media channels. Um, that's up to you, but for, for me, I think I would, I would stick to things that are more sort of purpose built for helping you um, and also have a stronger way of curating um, and, and managing who's seeing your information. The next tool, which I think is going to be incredibly powerful, especially for rare diseases, um, is genetics. So uh, about 80% of rare diseases have a genetic component. Um, and you can now get your whole genome sequenced. You don't even have to have a doctor order it for you. You can directly order that. And I actually just did that recently on, online. I looked for a lab that has, um, that gives me my, all of my data that does um, clinical grade sequencing. So it's a lab that is CLIA certified. That's C-L-I-A, CLIA certified. Um, one that does not sell my data or share my data um, on an individual level. Um, and I found sequencing.com fit all of those criteria uh, and they provided some useful reports as well. Things that look for rare diseases specifically, also things that um, will tell me you know, predictions about how I would respond to drugs based on my genetics. Um, and the price was under $400. So I went ahead and um, purchased sequencing, uh, my, my genome from sequencing.com. That's not an endorsement. Um, I, I haven't seen the reports yet or the data come back yet, um, but that's the kind of thing I would look for in a lab. When you get your genetic report back, there will be listed on it um, what they call pathogenic variants or likely pathogenic variants. Um, in your genome. And these are variations in your genome that um, have been known to cause disease in other folks or are likely to cause disease um, based on some evidence. And that's where I would start. When you're trying to generate hypotheses, I would look at all those genes that are um, pathogenic variants or likely pathogenic for you and see what diseases are associated with those genes and do any of those diseases explain your signs and symptoms? Because, I mean, when, you, when you're dealing with a ton of data, you need focus, right? And so we want to focus in on what's causing my signs and symptoms. Um, you may have pathogenic variants that aren't causing disease in you um, for whatever reason. And uh, the, the genome is very complicated. And, uh, you know, we're still, still learning a lot about it. So try to focus yourself on what's causing my signs and symptoms or what could be causing my signs and symptoms. As you start to accrue a list of potential diseases on your spreadsheet, um, you can go to, there are a few sources that I really like to go to to learn more about those diseases. Some, some sources that I like to go to are Gene Reviews, Stat Pearls, OMIM, and GARD. Um, there are other databases too, but those are some of my go-to sources, uh, particularly gene reviews and stat pearls. I'm going to take you on a quick tour of a gene reviews article. Um, so gene reviews is published by the National Library of Medicine. It's a very credible source, and um, it has well-structured articles. The first thing I like to do when I come to a gene reviews article is just take a quick look at this in the summary area. Um, especially under clinical characteristics, I would say just a quick sanity check. Does do these clinical characteristics kind of fit what I'm experiencing or what, you know what the patient is experiencing? Um, and if it really is just you know, not fitting well, like perhaps it only 
occurs, this disease only occurs starting in childhood, but you didn't have any symptoms until you were 30, well, probably isn't this disease. Um, so it's just a good way to do a quick sanity check. Um, from there, I like to go to uh, the d diagnosis section um, and look at what are the sort of clinical characteristics of the, of the, of the disease. Um, and then go to the establishing the diagnosis area. This is where you're going to find your, your diagnostic criteria uh, for the disease. And so this one you can see has um, evidence that could come from gen genetic testing, or it could come from, or additionally, it can come from um, clinical characteristics. So, and, and you can see how, how often are these clinical characteristics occurring in the disease. Um, and this is pretty powerful because like if you don't have language delay and cognitive impairment, then you probably don't have Angelman syndrome because 100% of people with Angelman syndrome do have that. So um, it's another quick way to sort of reject some hypotheses. Um, another section that's really critical for you is the differential diagnosis. This is like all the all the other things that this could be. If you think you might have Angelman syndrome, you need to consider these other things. It could be these, right? Um, and what I love about the way they organize these tables often is they'll have a disease, and then next to that they'll have like here are sort of the the distinguishing features of that disease, or the, here they call it the characteristic features. So it makes it relatively quick to go through the list and just see okay which which one seems to match what I'm experiencing the best. Um, you're seeing a lot of uh, acronyms in here. You can just come down to the bottom of the table. They always explain what those are. Um, and so that's another way to add additional hypotheses to your list of potential diagnoses. Um, and those are sort of the key things that I would go to when you're in the process of trying to find a diagnosis. Um, Gene Reviews also has information about management of diseases, um, which can be useful um, once you've made a diagnosis. And sometimes can be useful to help you make a diagnosis because if you, if there is disease specific treatment, and that means treatment that's actually treating the underlying disease, it's not just treating your symptoms, it's treating the underlying disease. If there is disease specific treatment, you can use that as a test to see um, you know, is it to, to, to give you more evidence that you have the disease. Because if you respond to that disease-specific treatment, it's more likely that you actually have the underlying disease. Um, so management can be useful uh, in, in the diagnosis, but I would start with those other sections first because um, those will help you to kind of quickly rule out the disease if it's really, you know, doesn't match you well and also get other di diseases on your list that you should be considering. We've, we've generated a whole bunch of hypotheses. Now we're moving into hypothesis testing and drawing conclusions. So um, a quick sanity check that I always do to, to start is going to gene reviews or stat pearls, one of these um, trusted sources, and looking at the description of the disease and just doing a quick sanity check and say, you know, does this fit with what I'm experiencing? And so as you do this kind of quick sanity check, you can either remove things from your list or just put them further down on the list. The next thing I would do is um, look at the diagnostic criteria listed for each of those diseases um, and see how well do you fit those diagnostic criteria. If you fit all the diagnostic criteria for a disease, then you should bring that to the attention of uh, your doctor, some medical professionals, and see, do they, do they agree um, if this fits? You may have a diagnosis at that point um, if you meet all those diagnostic criteria. Often those diagnostic criteria will include some things that you may need to test, um, blood tests, imaging, genetic testing. Um, in about 80% of these, there will be a genetic uh, component to, that, to the diagnostic criteria. Uh, which can help you shortcut your way to a diagnosis if you've already done all the sequencing of your genome. Um, if you haven't done sequencing of your genome, then you would have to kind of go out and do 
individual gene tests, which can get more expensive and more time consuming. Um, sometimes though, you go through the diagnostic criteria, you look at the descriptions, and it's still really kind of fuzzy whether or not you fit some of these diseases. Um, this is where a, kind of a higher level of decision making is needed, um, and often this is left to experts, but unfortunately in the rare disease space, uh, experts can be very difficult to find, and sometimes you're going to have to be the expert. So, if you're hacking your way to it, here's how I would lean in. Um, I would look at the criteria for causation, which were described by Bradford Hill back in 1965. The criteria for causation um, basically tell you when, when can you infer that a something has caused something else. So in this case, we're asking, when can we infer that a specific disease has caused my symptoms? I'm not gonna go through all of those right now, um, but you can check my blog post and look through those carefully to um, see how you would apply each of these. Even after doing all of this, some people may not have a diagnosis. In fact, if uh, among the people who go to the leading centers, um, of excellence for rare diseases in the world. Only f I mean, fewer than half of the people who go to these centers come out with a diagnosis. So it's hard and your diagnosis may not be known to the world. Like that disease may not be described yet. Um, so what, what can you do? You can keep observing, keep recording your observations. Over time, you will accumulate a greater body of evidence at the same time, the world's medical literature continues to evolve, research continues to go forward, and eventually you may find a match um, between your evidence and the growing information about the, the disease. So don't lose hope, keep at it, be consistent, and um, I believe that that will give you the best chance of finding a diagnosis for your rare disease. So, I'm Tim McLaren, and this has been Hacking Your Way to a Diagnosis in 2023. Thank you so much for listening.